Now to get into the parts of a cell. We begin our tour with the nucleus. This is where almost all of a eukaryotic cell's DNA is found. Almost all, like 99.99% of it. I'll tell more about the ribosomes here also. The nucleus is often analogized to the brain of the cell. It is usually the largest organelle, and when we were looking at those cheek epithelial cells, it was the only organelle we could clearly see. The nuclear envelope is the double layer of phospholipids that encloses the nucleus. So, to be more clear, a plasma membrane is one bilayer, and the nuclear envelope is two bilayers. Inside the nucleus is the DNA, and most of the time it is unpacked DNA. The chromosomes are not visible unless the cell is dividing, like it will in Unit 3. So the DNA in its unpacked form is called chromatin. The nucleus often will have one or more denser regions called nucleoli, or just one nucleolus. This name means little nucleus, and it is where special RNA molecules are produced, namely the RNA molecules that are part of the ribosomes, but not messenger RNAs. The chromatin, comprised of long threads of DNA that are wrapped around protein spools called histones. The nuclear envelope is studded with protein complexes that make up the nuclear pores, which allow traffic into and out of the nucleus proper. Here's an SEM image of a nucleus that's been finely sheared to reveal details of the nuclear envelope. You can see the inner and the outer membranes, as well as some of the nuclear pores. In this TEM image, you can see the pores at greater magnification and see that there are several protein complexes that make up each pore complex. One more feature of the nuclear envelope to tell you about, and that's the nuclear lamina. This TEM image looks like something woven, and that woven stuff is protein which makes up the nuclear lamina. This structure reinforces the envelope and keeps it from collapsing in on the DNA, kind of like tent poles. This last image here is of the chromatin when it's condensed into chromosomes, unordered, and then ordered over here on the left and right, and then down below here as uncondensed chromatin in the nucleus. The chromosomes have been stained with fluorescent dyes, but you probably already guessed that. Notice that the colored chromatin is kind of behaving itself. What I mean by that is these condensed chromosomes were like jars of finger paints, and then they were opened up and the paint let out, you might expect to see a grayish brownish blob of uncondensed chromatin down here. But that's not what we see. We're seeing the colors remaining entangled but discrete. This means that chromatin remains organized even when uncondensed, which is an interesting observation. Ribosomes are where messenger RNAs are decoded to make proteins. This is where the peptide bonds are formed and water is released. The ribosomes themselves are made out of RNA molecules and protein. And the ribosomes have two parts, a large subunit and a small subunit. They remind me of hamburger buns in this way. Ribosomes may be floating in the cytoplasm or they may be attached to parts of the endomembrane system like the nuclear envelope or the ER, which I'll talk more about very soon. In this TEM image, you can see both free and bound ribosomes. The same ribosome can go back and forth between being bound and free. It all depends on the polypeptide they're making at the time. Again, here's that hamburger bun-like diagram. This animated image, whose name is cursed, GIF, GIF, people get so worked up. Anyway, it shows the ribosome doing its job decoding a messenger RNA. The black line here is the messenger RNA, and the yellow blob is the small subunit. This green thing is the large subunit, and the blue things are called transfer RNAs, or tRNAs, which bring the amino acids in to get peptide bonded. As the polypeptide forms, you can see it growing out of the top of the large subunit. So this is a free ribosome, but a sequence of amino acids at the beginning of the polypeptide tell another molecule that it needs to be bound to the ER. 
So that's ribosomes for you, and you'll hear a lot more about them in Chapter 17 in Unit 3. We continue our tour of the cell with the rest of the membrane-bound organelles, which, again, eukaryotes only. The endomembrane system is made of all the organelles on this list. This is another list just begging for a set of letters to be put in front of it to be recast as a multiple choice question. We've been introduced to the nuclear envelope and said a brief hello to the endoplasmic reticulum. So now we'll round up this half of chapter six with more information about the endomembrane system. Endoplasmic reticulum is kind of fun to say. You should try it once or twice. Endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so it gets to be a mouthful, so let's just call it ER from here on out. Endoplasmic means inside the cytoplasm, and reticulum means little net, because that's kind of what it looks like under the microscope. The ER is attached to the nuclear envelope, and there are two types of ER, smooth and rough. Rough ER is ER with ribosomes, and smooth ER lacks ribosomes. In this drawing, the nuclear envelope and ER are different colors, but that's just for clarity's sake. They really are continuous with each other. A couple of other things to notice in this illustration. The ER is made of flattened sacs of membrane that have an internal space, kind of like a pita bread. Each sac is called a cisterna, and the space inside is called a lumen. We'll see lumens quite a bit. It's a very common word. Bits of the ER can be pinched off into bubbles called transport vesicles. The rough ER looks more like stacks of pancakes, while smooth ER looks more like funnel cake to me. But I guess I was probably hungry the first time I saw them. This TEM image shows how the two types of ER are interconnected there's also a clear change in shape between them. The smooth ER has the following functions, yet another list that could well become a multiple choice question. The smooth ER makes lipids and metabolizes carbohydrates. The smooth ER also detoxifies things like drugs and poisons, and it can store calcium ions. The rough ER produces proteins with the ribosomes that are attached, as well as glycoproteins, which are part carbohydrate and part protein. The rough ER also takes the lipids synthesized in the smooth ER and makes them into membranes to become other parts of the endomembrane system, including transport vesicles. The Golgi apparatus are named after this dashing Italian with his awesome mustache. The Golgi apparatus, also called Golgi bodies, are also made up of cisterni that have a lumen inside. However, the Golgi apparatus has a different function. The Golgi apparatus modifies the products of the ER and prepare them for export out of the cell. This is very important in multicellular organisms that need certain cells to produce certain biomolecules, like hormones, for example, and then to export them out to the rest of the body. The Golgi apparatus have distinct faces, a receiving face, usually facing the nucleus in the ER, and a shipping face, where vesicles with the finished products are released. These faces have names that you should recall. The receiving face is called the cis face. Think same side as the nucleus. Cis is on the same side. And the shipping face is the trans face, away from the nucleus. The entire structure tends to be curved, that's very normal, kind of looking like a sloppy Wi-Fi symbol with the cis face on top and the trans face below. Next up are the lysosomes. Lyso is a Greek word root that means breaking, and a lysosome is like a vesicle that instead of moving molecules around in the tiny sac, it contains a wrecking crew of biological molecules that can break down all kinds of macromolecules. The hydrolytic enzymes function best at low pH. Lysosomes fuse with other membranous sacs, 
like a food vacuole and the enzymes do their work on the food particles inside. Lysosomes can also break down damaged organelles or other structures that have lost their function, kind of like a cellular recycling program. Food vacuoles are just one kind of vacuole. In general, a vacuole is a large vesicle or a bubble of membrane that is derived from other parts of the endomembrane system. Food vacuoles, previously mentioned with lysosomes, are used by single-celled organisms in order to feed. Most cells don't have mouths or anything like a mouth, so they feed by a process called phagocytosis. More on that in the next chapter. Contractile vacuoles function like tiny pumps to help single-celled eukaryotes to shed excess water. Plants and fungi often have large central vacuoles, which are used for storage and to keep the plasma membrane attached to the cell wall. Here's another animated image of a contractile vacuole. You can see it squeeze the water out. The scientific term for squeezing is contracting, thus contractile vacuole. Here's another look at the central vacuole in a plant cell. You can see that it occupies a large proportion of the cell volume. So, to wrap up the endomembrane system, first of all, eukaryotes only, not for bacteria or archaea. The endomembrane system allows the cell to divide up tasks. The nuclear envelope with its double bilayer forms the center of the endomembrane complex and is connected directly to this rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The products made in the ER can be modified in the Golgi apparatus, where vesicles can then be exported to the plasma membrane and out of the cell. Lysosomes and vacuoles are also part of the endomembrane system. This brings this half of the chapter to a close. See you in part two.